Hello and welcome to the Growth Experts Funded Now What podcast with your host, Andrew Lee Miller. You're in store for a chat about funding, marketing, startups, and all things growth. All right, we're here with Damien Cantalo. Thank you so much, Damien, for joining. How are you today, Thanks for sir? having me, Andrew. Excellent. Doing well, thank you. Awesome. So Damien is a founder in the cybersecurity space who actually helps startups. So I'm super excited to have him here because as someone who's been working with startups for nearly 20 years, I know that we just focus on growth and marketing and we don't think about compliance until it's too late. And I often say when I speak around the world that the most popular or the most successful and most powerful startup founders that I I see are the reactive, not the preventative. Let's just move fast and break stuff. But that's why we need a service like what you offer. So tell us a little bit about Apollo Secure and why you created it. Sure. So Apollo Secure is an automated cyber and compliance platform for startups and small businesses. And the reason I created the business was because I was in the hot seat myself. I started in cybersecurity about 20 years ago. So we were selling to mid-market and enterprise customers. And then more recently, I've been... um, running uh, tech startup businesses. <clears throat> and we were on the receiving end of these vendor risk questionnaires. So little startup does a deal with a big client. The big client mm-hmm. says, you've got to meet these 50 or 100 requirements or we won't deal with you. And even though my background was in cybersecurity, it was a massive leap between startups being here and the requirements being here. And it's mm-hmm. super expensive and time consuming to bridge that gap. You know, you've got to pay consultants, you've got to buy technology, you've got to do all sorts of things. Right. Um, and so I thought there's got to be a better way. So we built a platform that essentially automates and streamlines all of those traditionally manual processes that you need external help for. Nice. And, you know, is there, you mentioned startups and SMEs, but then you also mentioned, you know, companies that are selling uh, to bigger companies. So is this really like SaaS startups? It's not like you're dating apps and different, st- and, you know, real estate, small startups, I mean, small businesses, like what, are some target industries that you're focusing on? Uh, B2B SaaS startups is the key Makes because sense. they're the ones where it's a, a little guy dealing with a big guy. Um, yep. So like FinTech is perfect, right? You've got like a, you know, a, a 10 person oh. startup working with a, a global bank, for example. So yeah. the, 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 the disconnect is, is, a... is more significant. Yeah. So, and it's kind of a, it's a deal breaker for the startup. It's like, wow, we've just closed the biggest deal we could ever imagine or we're about to. And then they get hit with this massive a tiny little hiccup and you lose the whole yeah, deal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so that's, that's, that's the low. That's a great niche right. to start with. It makes a lot of mm. sense. And that's mm. the reason I was asking was for the targeting and when we get into the marketing, but walk me through what the funding situation, you recently just raised some funding. How much did you raise? Yeah. So we raised 600 K in a pre-seed round. So our first external funding, which is good. That's yeah. Nice. So that's, awesome. that's uh, gets us to the starting line. Of course you do all this work and uh, that's really just to kind of start the race. So, um, mm-hmm. so that's good. We've got that under our belt. So now we're kind of planning how to best allocate those funds to really grow the business. Totally. Well, this would be a great call for that, but let's talk a little bit more about the fundraising situation. One of the reasons I think people will listen to this podcast is because they want to hear from someone who actually did it. You know, mm-hmm. I would say there is, I haven't seen real statistics out there because everybody tries to raise money, but most of the reason that startups don't fit, don't succeed is they either don't hit profitability or revenue and they don't, or they don't raise money. They die out before those things happen. Mm-hmm. So how are you able to raise funding for this in such a crazy time right now where it's quite difficult to raise venture capital and where your investors in Australia or abroad or a mix, uh, to walk us through mm-hmm. that. Sure. So yeah, as you say, it's no secret that the funding market is is pretty tight at the moment. So it is a difficult time to raise. So you've got to be super clear on what your value proposition is and also just target the right types of investors. Mm-hmm. Um, so we raise here in Australia. So I'm here, here, here based in Sydney. Um, so um, certainly you've got to get local investors. For a pre-seed round, what, what I've found, and this is probably my, my biggest tip or learning on, on cap raising, not, not just in this business, but historically, the two mm-hmm. key critical success criteria for identifying suitable investors. First, they've got to know you. And second, they've got to know the market you're playing in. Um, now, you don't have to have both of those things. If you've got both of, both of those things, then you've got a really good chance of raising money. So someone you've worked with before who knows the market, awesome. Mm-hmm. If someone knows you, and they don't have to be your best mate from school or anything like that, but someone who you've built a relationship over, over time with or yeah. you've worked with or they're aware of a previous business or whatever, um, 
and then knowing the market because the problem is some people might know you but if they think cybersecurity i don't know what that's all about i'm not mm-hmm. going to put you know 100 grand or a couple hundred grand or whatever into this business so if you can if you can tick both of those boxes that's fantastic now i know some founders might think i don't have a massive rolodex of heaps of investors and i don't have my, my, my industry is a bit niche so there's not a lot of specialists in that area but you've got to flip that to then start building yeah. relationships with those people and that might take six or 12 months take investors out to coffee and then there's different databases and systems you can use to find out which investors invest in which verticals. Totally. So target those guys, take them out for a coffee or just hit them up on LinkedIn and share some posts and relevant stuff to them, build those relationships, make sure that they know the space and then you've got a much better chance. That is amazing advice. And it, and it makes sense. It's almost common sense. You know, I would call that even lo- focus on, focusing on lower hanging fruit first, your own mm-hmm. network, then the people who have the keywords, cybersecurity investor in their LinkedIn or in their Twitter profile mm-hmm. are obviously going to be less of a distance between meeting them and convincing them than someone who doesn't even know anything about the space. So that makes a lot of sense. And I think the more you can um, shrink the total net that you're focusing on as opposed to anybody who's got money mm-hmm. in the whole world, then you have mm-hmm. to convince them so much. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, shrinking that net's really important to just focus on the people that are already knowledgeable about the space. That's really good feedback. And obviously it worked for you with regards to, um, what you are saying about what you're going to be putting the money towards. Obviously this is a pretty high tech product. How big mm-hmm. is your team right now on the engineering side? Or are you a builder yourself? Uh, I'm former developer, but I'm off the tools now. So I like nice. to say, I know enough to be dangerous. So, um, but the, the, the guys don't let me on the tools cause I'd break stuff. Um, so yeah, so, um, we've got a total sort of virtual team of sort of five to seven people. Some of those, you know, part and contractors, etc. Um, so there's a handful of those that are on, on the tools, but we've actually made in terms of the product development, a decision that I've made though. And, and if you look at different advice around team efficiency around product development. There's a certain tipping point once you get to a certain team size where your first developer is certain, you know, delivers a certain amount of output. Adding a second person doesn't make you twice as efficient. In fact, it makes you less than one times efficient because they've got to communicate with each other. You've got to document better, you know, you scrum and stand up Mm -hmm. um, kind of processes are a bit more complicated. So it's not until you get to sort of three or four, you know, depending on how good they are and how well they work together but you have to reach a certain critical mass before you actually become more efficient. Yeah. So we've got, um, so Mark, who's my CTO, he drives the whole platform development. We've got some other guys helping him on, on some fringe activities, but nice. we sort of decided until we get to and needing a team of say, you know, four or five or whatever the number is, let's just keep it to one, keep it simple. We're way more agile. We don't have the kind of um, the overheads of managing teams as much. Um, mm-hmm. So we've given more of that control to Mark. And then once we reach that scale where we need to really ramp up, then we'll hire a handful of guys and, and scale it from there. And that's nice. probably more at our next investment round. We didn't want to go and yeah. spank all of our pre-seed funding on a team of five developers. So yeah, so totally. we're keeping it tight, staying agile, Lean, baby. saving the funds, and then and then we'll grow when we need to. Smart. Well, I'm going to talk to you today about marketing stuff that doesn't really cost any money. But before we go awesome. into that, you mentioned a couple of things there about one being dangerous. And I think that's actually a great word for working in cybersecurity. Every cybersecurity startup that I've ever advised or coached has some form of a hacker on the founding team. Mm-hmm. And I think like the, there's this term I use called the FUBU effect for startups. I don't know if you know this American clothing line, FUBU. It was a yes. black black founded clothing line, but the yeah. FUBU stands, standard, mm-hmm. stood for for us, by us. And so mm-hmm. what that means to me with founders is I look for founders that are solving a problem that they had themselves. So you mentioned, you know, that as an operator of different tech startups, you saw this problem that you had, where you had to spend days and weeks on compliance. I saw it with my wife's, wife's startup. She sells to Netflix, Dell, Cisco, Microsoft, Headspace, big corporations. And just to become right. onboarded took like weeks and, mm-hmm. you know, g- going back to lawyers. So I totally feel that. But do you or Mark or anyone legitimately have a hacking background is that part of the reason you can be honest? Well, this is this yeah, is public, I, but yeah, sure. I, I think people use the term hacking um, fairly loosely. There's like growth hacking, obviously, in your space, and just the general startup hacking, like move fast and break things. Is sort of a hacker mentality. And yeah. ironically, the only people who don't like being called a hacker are actual cybersecurity <laughs> hackers. <laughs> so that, that it's it's kind of one of those weird things that um, 
they, they like to be, you know, they say, oh, they're, they're threat actors or where, you know, cybersecurity researchers threat. or whatever. But yeah, well, threat actors is a generic term that you use to like the bad guys. And they say, oh, don't call them hackers. It's a bit of a cheap name. But ironically, everyone else wants to be a hacker. You know, if you're a developer or a marketer, it's like, oh, let's be a growth hacker or whatever. So so it's kind of an interesting one. So I wouldn't say like I, I'm not at the level of being a cybersecurity hacker or, a you know, right. um, a security researcher or, or whatever term they, they use to describe themselves. So mm-hmm. um, one of the guys in our team is um more a security you just need analyst. one you just need yeah, one exactly yeah. yeah yeah but mark's more of the product development expert so got it um certainly we do have the hacking mentality of you know be scrappy you have to be agile run off the sm- uh, smell of an oily rag in the early days and and just yeah. sort of test things and see what works and then and then kind of you know iterate from there great well those are two different things the marketing growth hacking is is still you know, very important, the mindset of an early stage startup. And, you know, it's a big difference raising hundreds of thousands versus tens of millions because of the climate. And I still think it's really great as a pre-seed, but you're not like just throwing cash at every potential growth opportunity. You have to stay lean. But what I meant is, you know, the last cybersecurity guy that I interviewed, he was literally like, yeah, when I was in college, I hacked into 80 university. And he was like super open to, you know, he is the person that he wants to protect companies against. This is a little bit different because you're helping with compliance and I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, my point was just that, you know, whenever I talk to cybersecurity people, you know, you got to have one person on the team that is actually dangerous or was dangerous at some point. Yeah, we've got a couple Um, of those guys. We just keep them behind the scenes. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. No, but that's that's, uh, part of where the value comes of working with you. You know, that's how you're able to build... Um, the right tools for a company. Um, I use the example uh, when I speak privately with cybersecurity companies of, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can with, with uh, Tom oh, Hanks. Awesome or, film. You know, yeah. yeah, but the idea is that guy ended up getting a 40-year illustrious career advising the, uh, the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the CIA or the FBI or yeah. whatever it was mm-hmm. on how to protect against all this fraud. Mm-hmm. And so you yeah. know, if you can't beat them, you join them. And you know what I mean? And so I think yeah. that's what the opportunity to work with a company like yours is besides the uh, obvious time saving and, and, you know, your conversion rate going up more with these companies, because it's really easy for them to, to get compliant and stuff that makes a lot of sense. You know, for me, uh, I've, you mentioned FinTech, I've worked in FinTech a lot and it's the worst industry as a marketer because of compliance. Mm -hmm. So there might be another aspect for you to even help with (laughs) automating compliance on the marketing side, because it would Mm -hmm. always be a series of emails. I mean, even up to this year, I've worked with FinTech clients and uh, hey, here's what we want to do. You have to run this by compliance, Andrew. Okay, yeah, then that Mm -hmm. adds another week to the latency and the the slowness Mm -hmm. of our our campaigns getting off the ground. So really awesome. So I would imagine- there. And so just to jump in on that point no, is fine. that historically, and, and, and what you were saying there is historically compliance, whether that's cyber compliance or corporate governance or whatever it is, it's seen as an inhibitor where it's mm-hmm. that, oh, we've got to go through that process of getting this thing approved. Whereas now, because there's so much pressure to meet compliance obligations to help grow the business, like those vendor risk questionnaires and having certifications that help you grow, um, security is now becoming more of an enabler, like a sales enabler for growth. So mm-hmm. it's not a case of, oh, what a hassle. It's like, hey, if we actually do these things, let's not fight it. Let's not try to swim upstream. If we do these things as a business, it op- opens up new sales channels and new opportunities. So we're kind of trying to turn the narrative on that on that story. That's a great segue into the marketing, you know, like mm-hmm. the first thing, I mean, it sounds like you've already, how, by the way, what traction are you at, like with clients and, you know, how long have you been out sure. in the market selling? Yeah, so we launched the business last year. We, we sort of really went to market around Christmas um, just gone. So we're almost into nice, a, huh? a full year of being in Good market. Good Christmas present for the team. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. It was more hard work than anything for the launch. But anyway, Christmas present nonetheless. So, um, so yeah, so we launched around then and we've got close to 100 customers on the platform now, which is ahead of Amazing. target for where we are. So that's great. And that's... Um, big chunk of tech startups and also some SMEs um, with some other well-known brands. So um, brands like Surf Life Saving uh, here in Australia, there's obviously a big kind of thing about Australian Mm -hmm. beach culture. Um, So great brands like that who have come on board where they're sort of SMEs with a lot of um, staff and and surf clubs around um, 
around the country. And um, so we're helping them with their cybersecurity. So we've got some, starting to get some good brands and, and some great startups that we're supporting and they're supporting us. So, Amazing. So yeah, so, so we're on our way, still early days, but on our way. Oh, a hundred is really good. And you know, do you, are you keeping track of like NPS and average lifetime, not value, but like how long, because I would imagine once you get onboarded with this, you see how much time it's saving, you're never going away. So you probably have a very low churn rate. Is that true so far? Yeah, it's very sticky for those reasons that you outlined that you don't never want to sort of pull out of doing your compliance. Why go back in work. time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've invested the time to do it. Um, so they, they stay on. So we've only had a couple of customers churn and mostly that was because a bit of a change in their business or when mm -hmm. you deal with startups, sometimes they don't always work out. So yeah, if they've exactly. sort of pull back and whatever else, and we've lost a couple of clients for that, but we understand, but those who are, who are, who are growing with us, they're all, all very sticky, which is great. Awesome. That's good to hear for, for this marketing discussion. Um, last question before I get into the marketing juice of the call. Um, what is the price point? I would imagine, I'm going to guess this is a, you know, starting at about $2,000 a month U S is that right? Oh, I've got good news for you, Andrew. It's nowhere near that much. <laughs> well, it's, it's to, look, the reality is to do what we do with a consultant, to pay a cybersecurity consultant to come in and do all the stuff, it's about $50,000 for them to do yeah. all of those things and do it as a custom wow. kind of consultative gig. Whereas we uh, wrap that up into a SaaS subscription model starting at $200 a month um, for, the, for the basic plan. Five hundred dollars a month for the standard plan, and eight hundred dollars for the a month for the pro plan. So amazing! It's it's very affordable because I, I knew being a startup founder myself um, uh, historically, I, I knew that yeah, you're always price sensitive, and there's always that argument around pricing. So totally. I just thought we want more scale versus you know friction around price discussions. So we prefer to have a thousand clients at a couple hundred bucks a month than you know totally. clients at you know high price or whatever. So yeah, and if you can help companies. At the earlier stage, they'll, like you said, it's sticky. They'll stick around. You'll, your LTV will end up being much higher. I'm very mm -hmm. rarely off that much with the pricing of SaaS <laughs> products. I think that was because I was thinking more on the average of a cybersecurity product rather than a compliance product. Pro compliance sure. products are usually in the four to $500 a month to somewhere range, that, at least that I've seen in the US. But cybersecurity, yeah. I mean, especially when they're protecting against threats, that cost millions and tens of millions are, you know, sure. usually really up there. So maybe that'll be some future things. So awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I know how uh, to achieve what you mentioned, uh, getting more of those stakeholders. Um, but really quick, I guess I do have one more question and I promise it's the last one. How long <laughs> is the sales cycle and do you have to meet and give a demo or is it like a self-service thing, sign up and they're just using the dashboard on their own right sure. away? So sales cycle is between one hour to three months um we've literally had um calls I, I had a call not too long ago where literally only got halfway through the demo and the guy pretty much said shut up and take my money um, oh and, and my i God. couldn't even fit out, i couldn't even finish the demo because the thing is with these um cybersecurity compliance um uh projects um we, we always say cybersecurity is either the bottom of your priority list. It's like, yeah, I'll get around to it. Or it's the top of your priority list, either because yeah. you've got that big client pressuring you to do it, or you've just had a data breach or one of your competitors or partners yeah. have. And then it's like, oh my God, drop everything. We've got to do this right now. So mm -hmm. when we find the client with a compelling event, um, which is any of those situations I described and others like cyber insurance, then it's really fast. Insurance thing, it's, it's, it's like, we've got to do it now. So as I said, I've been cut off to say, I don't need to yeah. see the rest of the demo. Just, you know, just send me the bill. Um, or sign me up. Um, but others, are, we normally need to talk to the CEO and the CTO at a startup and, and at an SME, yeah, you know, similar roles, but maybe not always as senior. So sometimes it just maybe takes a few weeks between speaking to one decision maker than the other, and then maybe they have mm -hmm. to sit on it and then they come back. So yeah, as Got I said, it. anywhere from, or they, from or just shit needs to, an emergency event needs to happen, you know, mm -hmm. and that's actually quite common with SaaS products is we focus on promotion, staying top of mind, owning the thought leadership in the market, speaking at events, getting on podcasts, doing white papers, mm -hmm. putting out this content. And we'll talk a little bit about the strategies behind that. But we do all of that so that when shit does blow up, they go, oh my God, we need to talk to Apollo Secure. Or I saw an ad from them. I've been retargeted from them. Um, yeah. You know, because there really is, you know, there's probably a little bit of search marketing that you can do um for to to have people come inbound and maybe that's the first little cool growth hack to talk about 
I'm not exactly sure because I haven't been a leader at a company like that where something has happened, but I'm assuming the first thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, something like that happens, you go to Google and you search what to do if blank but blank happens or what to do when a client asks for blank but blank com compliance. So you can create those materials, those keyword dense blog articles, those mm -hmm. YouTube videos, those podcast episodes with those search terms as the focus key phrase, and that will come up on Google and that will bring people into you when they're having those issues. That's about the only thing I think you can really do. I mean, you could even put an ebook on Amazon, anything that's a search engine that you think people might search on. So Google is obviously mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. YouTube is number two, Amazon is moving up there, TikTok is up there now pretty too, pretty high mm -hmm. too, but not so much for businesses. Um, but if, if you, you know, I would imagine there's an internal emergency crisis conversation at the company, and then they give the CTO or something, figure out a plan of action and secretly on his or her own, they're going to Google to search. What the hell do we do? What software is out there to help us mm -hmm. uh, uh, solve this problem? And so, you know, definitely you want to own the search terms. It's not expensive for something niche like this, especially in just the Australian market. You're an Island. Mm -hmm. I could own all of the search traffic for a couple thousand dollars a month and just bidding really high for really long tail search term. What I mean is long tail is not just the word cybersecurity, because then you're going to waste money on mm -hmm. anybody doing a school research paper, whatever. But, you know, and I'm, I'm just making up a keyword here, but crisis response, cybersecurity tools or something like that, or, mm -hmm. you know, compliance, cybersecurity, um, SaaS platforms or s mm -hmm. so, uh, software t solutions. You can mm -hmm. figure out every amalgamation of those two to three to four word search terms. And you're almost never going to be wasting money, even if it's mm -hmm. three or $4 Australian on the term, it's giving you a lot of thought, uh, thought leadership and exposure and brand awareness. Mm -hmm. Cause you're going to come up with the big players only in the market. Um, and so it's a good thing. So that is what I call ground cover paid advertising. Even if you've, you know, don't want to put any money into paid advertising, that paid search is really important because it takes 30 minutes of your time to build that campaign. And mm -hmm. you have such a high LTV. I mean, if we're, I think you're probably going to estimate two to three years average lifetime mm -hmm. of the customer. So if the average mm -hmm. is 500 bucks, you're talking like $15,000 US or Australian mm -hmm. for the average customer. So if you just leave that running at $500 a month or $1,000 a month, you can guarantee you're going to close at least one customer a year out of those paid mm -hmm. ads. I mean, even if the website was horrible, which it's not, it looks great. Um, so I think that's the first thing is do some pay. Are you doing anything like that? Paid search ads? This is a great time for this conversation because we're literally just starting our marketing spend. Um, obviously nice. having secured the investment and we just launched the new website. So we said, let's get that the website great. right and converting and then Correct. drive some traffic there. So we're literally just about to pull the trigger on some, some paid uh, advertising. So looking at SEO, SEM some social through LinkedIn, a few other things to talk through. So Makes yeah, we're, we're kind of just making that decision cool. where to spend and how to do so it. So don't spend on anything else. I mean, you can do LinkedIn ads if you, if you really want to focus on that target, but I'm going to tell you about a free way to target mm -hmm. everybody. Cause when you're talking about so niche, like CEO, CTO, B2B SaaS companies in Australia to start, mm -hmm. it's, you know, how many can there really be? Maybe 30,000, 25,000. So you don't need to spend money on ads to really hitting them. But if you go back to that first thing that I mentioned, those blog articles, those pieces of content that you're going to create to speak to the people that are having those emergency scenarios, you can take that content and put that into ads on LinkedIn and it gets tremendously cheap cost per clicks. Blog content mm -hmm. specifically for technical things is somewhere around 20, 25 cents Australian per click. Mm -hmm. And everybody that advertises on LinkedIn is going to comment on this back. That's not possible, but it is when you're focusing on a really niche thing and a technical piece of content, because the only people that that's going to speak to is specific job descriptions and the specific industries. And you can do that, that detailed level of targeting. Now the LinkedIn ads platform is going to tell you, you need to expand this audience. You're not going to get very good scale, but we know that their goal is to get us to spend more money, not for us to actually inundate the people who are going to be just like with your investors, which is also another um, market that you can focus on your ads on. You can just create a VC investor 
um, target and run the same ads to them passively, really low budget mm -hmm. cost per click, $5 a day, just so you're passively showing to anybody that says they're a cybersecurity investor for years and years. And then they're going to come inbound on your, when it's your next round. So a lot of people don't realize you can do that low budget stuff on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So LinkedIn, Google search, the only thing you should spend money on period. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Google display, YouTube ads, you could do it if it was a larger total addressable market. Unless you want to, mm -hmm. if you want to, um, green light a new market, like you want to move to the UAE and work with companies there, then you can spend a little bit money, more money on like flashy branding related advertising, but that's all you need for paid advertising. Um, mm -hmm. so going back to that content initiative, that's, that usually, um, if you don't have a marketer internally, it's something you need to bring someone in, but we still would want to go through Mark or the other guys in the background, hackers that to work on that content. But the idea is you're giving away as much free advice and keyword dense free advice as possible in these articles and YouTube videos so that a company that can't even afford 200 or $400 a month can take this information and be able to do somewhat, um, get somewhat successfully, uh, get over that hack or that terrible event that happened to them or that client coming in. But really what it's going to do is every paragraph has a hyperlink to get started and try the free for, do you have a freemium model? Can they get started for seven days trying it out or yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we do. So we, we just launched that, launching that with a new website. So that's a, a new thing we need to be getting out there for sure. Amazing. And you know, with that, uh, you want to really make sure that they can actually get access to an, enough part of the product to get an aha moment out of it in that short time. Mm -hmm. It often doesn't happen with something like like this. So it might be like a 30 day or even, you know, 80 percent of the product. You get it for as much as you as long as you want, but you only get to do like one compliance mm -hmm. interaction per month or mm -hmm. something out of it. So as soon mm -hmm. as the business grows, they have to grow with you. So strategically mm -hmm. building that is important. But uh so we talked about paid ads, we talked about content initiatives, which is, I can't stress how important that is enough because that is a big part of the SEO is those, those, you know, obviously, you know, your SEO, your homepage is going to be focused on, you know, compliance solutions for SMEs or something like that, that broad search term. It's going to be difficult as a new player to the market to get to the first page ranking with that really quickly, but those search term related posts and pieces of content, those can get to the first page pretty quickly because a lot of businesses don't really think about that as part of an SEO strategy or a content marketing strategy. So whatever, doing research to figure out whatever people search when that shit blows up, whether, oh my God, a huge client just came, we have to do this. We have no idea how to do this compliance, how to do mm -hmm. compliance for B2B SaaS startups. Making that content is going to really drive really good SEO and, and inbound traffic. Um, but let's talk about outbound a little bit because, you know, like I said, um, you know, it's important to be top of mind, but you reach out to people, you build your LinkedIn, you build an audience of, of people that are, oh yeah, we'll follow you. We don't really know if anything we're ever going to need to have this problem. And then when the problem hits, they see, have seen your organic content that you're sharing on LinkedIn or your newsletter or whatever it is uh, on your YouTube or Instagram, wherever they choose to follow you from. And then they come back. And this happens to me myself time and time again, years down the line. Um, you know, even um, with regards to the outreach my team does for this podcast, people will say, no, I don't want to be on the podcast. We're not ready for it yet. And then they forget to come back when they are ready. But then like a year later, they're like, hey, Andrew, uh, we connected over something random, but actually now is the time for marketing. And you came to, you came to top of mind because I've seen your posts over the last year. Mm -hmm. And so really with the outbound stuff, you're really just trying to grow a network. And so there's two main ways that you want to grow an, uh, an outbound campaign or ca two ca outbound campaigns for this type of business, LinkedIn and email. Are mm -hmm. you doing either of those for out for lead generation yet? We have started with cold outreach email using um, like Woodpecker, um, okay. which does just email automation stuff. We've found it's good for sort of top of the funnel stuff. We haven't really totally. seen that conversion yet. So I think it's more just about pe people being aware of you, but you don't get heaps of people writing back going, oh, but this is so timely here, let's set up a call. So we'd like to see more of that, but we know it's yeah. traditionally been more top of the funnel. At least that's my understanding, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. That's no, that's right. I mean, that. I think that is what, cybersecurity is kind of like global warming. We know it's a huge problem, 
but it's like in the distance for most people. Mm. And so it's hard. The human brain is actually developed to worry about immediate risks because mm -hmm. they had to protect our hunted and gathered food. And, mm. you know, now that that's not an issue, we live in an abundance uh, in a situation, you know, you have to educate the market. And when you're a first mover to something like this, that's where, why I was harping on that content so much. You have to spend a lot of time and effort on that education. And that's what that outbound campaign is to you right now. Mm -hmm. It's educating people, letting them know. So you, the messaging in that outbound is really important. You can't go straight to hardcore sales messaging in that because it's not a top of, you know, so the first message should say, is this a problem that you guys are having right now? Mm. Just a question, right? Mm. Not a long message, barely introduce yourself one hyperlink. Hey, is, is compliance slowing down your deal flow? You know, something like that. And then if mm. they're like, no, it's not, we're really focused on this and that. Okay. And you know, they're not going to respond, but if they are there, if it is like, holy crap, my CEO just told me I need to work on this right now. Boom, you get them for a demo. That's going to be the one hour, stop your pitch. I'm ready to take my money um, guy. And that's great, but uh, that's not going to happen a lot. Most of the time, what's going to happen is that second through the sixth email on that automation is going to educate them. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to pull out case studies from some of those most happy hundred customers. And you're shaking your head because you already know the, comp the companies that have responded to you, giving you the most feedback. Those are the people you want to fly out to the Sydney office, you know, put them up for a day, bring them to the office to make some amazing videos with them. I mean, spend the money that is worth unbelievable amount of money. And, um, if you don't have those clients, then automate an email to all the hundred clients. Hey, we're, we're doing a, we're looking to fly somebody out and record content with you. It, please fill out this survey. Let us know if you, you know, and they're like, oh, wow, get flown out to Sydney, you know, which is not expensive for anybody in Australia. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost a ton, mm -hmm. but the idea is, oh, wow, put me up in Darlinghurst in a nice little Airbnb. And, uh, um, you know, for one night it might cost you a thousand dollars total, but you know, and then the videographer and everything, but that video and you, so in that automation, we want to test video testimonials, PDF case studies, um, you know, FAQs, uh, you know, stats and articles. If hopefully the last thing I think if we, if we have time, I, I have time, um, we'll talk about some, how to get PR. You want to include some of those top PR articles in that automation as well. And you'd be mm -hmm. surprised. Let's say they total, they go through nine emails. Only that first one was really salesy. Maybe the seventh one is going to have a link to book a meeting with the team if they just want to get a demo. Um, maybe the eighth one is a pre recorded demo because most people won't even want to look at it. another meeting on the calendar. Fuck off, mate. I don't want to take more time. So, what I'm saying is in that automation, we're putting in every single lazy way that they can discover why they need to work with your company without taking much of their time. And even if they don't ever respond. They fucking never remember, never forget the name of Apollo secure by the end of that series. So that's usually nine emails over 60 days. And then we just put them into a newsletter list and they can't even remember by the time. I mean, I don't know what the GDPR rules are like in Australia. I'm pretty sure it's all off. Everything's fine. And all, <laughs> everything goes, it's not as stringent as GDPR or CCPR. Exactly. Yeah, so we're, we're yeah, kind of a little bit lighter, but that's changing, well, but yeah, it's still not as bad. As if, that. if you can't automate compliance for your own company, then you can't do it for <laughs> anyone else's. So I think you guys are good, <laughs> but, true. but, yeah. uh, so you want to put them in a newsletter list afterwards because they've already opened and you can put an, if this, then that, like if they open at least five of the emails, then we put them into the newsletter list. If they don't open it, don't bother them with a the newsletter. And on your newsletter, it's really just our top social media posts of the month, our top blog posts of the month, you know, a feature update for the month and maybe a case study or something, you know, and, and those four things you just drop into blocks, really easy to do. A newsletter for a company like this doesn't have to be that big. It could be an investor update as well, <clears throat> but it's mostly focused on just staying top of mind for potential customers because this kind of a business is not top of mind until it's emergency situation. And then they're going to go to Google. And so if you're on Google and they're like, oh, shit, I know that brand. I saw mm -hmm. something from them. They don't ever remember. Usually when I speak with clients of a new of a client a SaaS company like this, how did you originally find out about the company? Google is what they say all the time. And they don't really remember where they just say Google because that's what mm -hmm. we believe now. So all of that, we talked about paid ads, um, 
you know, search engine optimization, which I could talk for hours about, but that's the easiest growth hacking way to get started with it. Um, and then the last thing I want to tell you about is PR. Have you done any PR around the raise? At all in Australia? We've got, yeah, we've, we've got featured in a few different um, uh, publications here. So, so probably yeah, a handful of digital publications and did a bit of a um, TV interview, which was good with one of the startup channels nice. out here. So nice. getting a few bits and pieces that will leverage more and more, as you say. So we're just getting them up on the website at the moment. But we definitely want to get more of that because cybersecurity is top of mind. We want to get that sort of conversation yeah. started around yeah, how to, how to improve it. And how did you get that earned media? Are you working with an agency or was all just, oh, we saw you raised, we want to talk to you? Cold, cold outreach from us to You outreach, yeah, so, nice. Yeah, so we, we reached out to a few of them. And then as you know, once you get featured on something, a few people then follow, totally. um, pick it up and, and they reach, come in back. reach out to us. Cool. Yeah, so. so we haven't done any cybersecurity or like small business related media yet. It's just been like mostly like tech mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, it was more about the raise. I tried to weave in the story into that as well, which they always want to know about the business. But of course, we do want to get some pure, like not just about us and our raise, but actually what are we doing for our customers? Yep. Um, so that's where the value is. Yeah. So I think, you know, if one of those 100 customers, first of all, the raise is like the lowest hanging fruit. You got to do it. And you should definitely reach out with your press release to TechCrunch and Global Media just to get it. They, they'll usually, it's a little bit of a dry season for funding. So you think you can benefit from that. Um, you know, there's uh, Australian media uh, probably has already covered you, but get the global media just because you can. Um, and uh, it can't hurt with SEO and stuff. Having those links is awesome. Um, but uh, with regards to the, the ongoing PR, um, I think there's two tracks. So there is the problem that you're solving in the cybersecurity stuff. And then there is like the business and tech stuff. Um, well, and, and they're separate because cybersecurity media will talk about you just because it's a cool SaaS platform in the cybersecurity space. But like your CTOs are going to read that. Your, you know, your high tech um, decision makers are going to be reading that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the, the business related stuff, why this is such a big problem that you need to be paying attention to now. Um, also, not even just the emergency. You mentioned the two events. And so it's kind of like they're separate. You're talking about the, the protect yourself um, piece and then the like increase your deal flow and move faster but with this tool mm -hmm. is like the business mm -hmm. and SME and entrepreneurship related media. So I think um, those two things, what I would recommend is writing a press release and, uh, to those two individual stories. And you can use chat GPT, you can Google, you can actually buy my book or read my book and learn about how to do that as well. But there's a ton of information online uh, about how to write a press release. It's, it's pretty easy to be honest. And um, then it's that cold outreach that you're doing. And some, some real quick hacks there are going to Twitter and searching, you know, cybersecurity reporter, Australia. And you'd be surprised there's probably 40 and all of them have their email address in their Twitter. And that's because they want people to come at them with the stories. So what you do is you passively you put 10 minutes every day on the calendar in the morning to just going and looking for those emails and adding them to an Excel sheet. And then when you get it to like 100 or 200 or an event based thing happens in the company, like a feature release or we close a really big new client or a case study with a really big client. Like you mentioned a couple of big banner name companies that I don't personally know about. But if there's a company or a logo that everybody in Australia will know about, and you can use them as a case study. That's a huge thing to do PR with. I'll give you an example. I had a have a client in the telecom space in the Middle East, in Egypt. Very, very similar, high tech, large, long sales cycle. They did not get a client that moves forwards in an hour like you did. Um, but it was similar in the sense that they don't think they need them until they really need them. It's a service assurance platform that helps the mm -hmm. network operator not crash and lose their servants for millions of clients. And, uh, so we did outreach very similar. People think, oh, we don't really need you until we really need you. But w they had a huge client orange, uh, in Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, was a big for early client of there. So we did a big PR campaign around that, got a photo opportunity with the CEO to CEO, did the PR around that, made a case study out of that. And that greatly accelerated the sales cycle for that business because it's a banner company that everyone else just trusts. Oh shit, if they're doing it, we definitely mm -hmm. need to be doing it. So I think that's a PR opportunity. 
um, beyond just the overall talking about the problem. But with that, you really want to find some worst case scenarios. You know, you mentioned there isn't a lot of data out there. Might be an opportunity to do your own research and report. Your sample size doesn't have to be huge for that, by the way. I, mm -hmm. I can't think of an example, but let's say you send out a survey to your hundred, no, not your hundred clients, a hundred random businesses in Australia. Like, are you compliant? You know, yes or no. Um, the 75% are going to say no probably. And then boom, you just did this report and finds out that 75% of SaaS businesses are not actually compliant. That's your press release. And a lot of tech media will talk about that and use that report as factual, even though the sample size is small. I mean, that's why I don't personally trust the media just because I know that I can, that's literally, you have to really dig in and find out how is that research done and stuff. And I'm not saying to lie in any way to anybody listening to this, but faking it till you make it, what you got to do as an early stage startup. But with that survey, you can say, you know, we're giving away six months free of our pro platinum um, plan for one lucky business, just answer this survey. And so that's enough incentive to get a lot of companies to fill out the survey. And then you can also use that for sales too. So the companies that say they don't, or they're not compliant, boom, sales guy needs to go, Hey, you filled out this survey. I saw that you're mm -hmm. not compliant. I'd love to give you three months free to just try this out. You know, I think you will love it. And if you have that stickiness, you can do that kind of shit. And so it's, yeah, it helps idea. with PR, but it also helps with the sales, I think, also in finding out people that are not uh, not super compliant there. But, okay, mm -hmm. I think that's enough shotgun blast marketing advice for you for one day. No, but do you have any, qu any questions on what I went over today? Um, I think what we covered is good, at least at a high level. There's certainly a few, few pointers for me to go away. I've got a bit of homework to do, but... Um... One of the questions I did have um, yeah. more broadly is what are your thoughts on engaging an agency versus doing it yourself in, in the early days as a startup? Um, Cause yeah. typically you're sort of looking at, um, and, and, and I'll ask my next question about budget, but if you've got a limited budget, often you've, you know, most of the budget you've got would sort of go to the agency. So you're like, are they going to get double the return than you'd get yourself sort of thing? So what, yeah. what are your thoughts on that in the early stage? And, and if it's for a later thing, what's the trigger point for that? So, that's, a, on that one. that's an excellent question because it turns me into like a little salesman here because <laughs> full disclosure, I run an agency that works with early stage sure. startups. It is a yeah, horribly perfect. unprofitable segment to work on because it takes so much time to do it right, the, the marketing mm -hmm. for startups. So I don't think you, one, I will unequivocally say do not work with just a regular marketing agency. They will not understand how much effort it takes to be successful for a startup and for costs like reasons you would need a agency for every single marketing channel so we need an agency for social media we need an agency for content we need an agency so i believe in growth hacking everything and so i think you want to keep your costs low but also as a founder you need to be able to outsource the things that you're not amazing at so my agency specifically works with engineering and product focused founders so they can focus on that and we work post funding to basically out, take off all the marketing off of their plate, but we're full stack, full service, full time, and we can only work with a couple clients a year. Because of that, it's a high ticket price, and that's why we focus on recently funded startups. But the idea is that hiring and building out a team and finding culture fit takes such a longer time, you don't have that time to wait. And so we work six to 24 months to not have companies have to do that. A lot of times they just gotten funding, they want to augment that, that tech team, get the next version of the product out, get the next funding round done, and then work on building that incredible team. Once we have finalized the tool, the marketing playbook, the landing pages, the messaging, really finalized the type of content, the social strategy, the lead gen things that are working. Once we finalize that, that really works. And I got into that after my third exit as a head of marketing of a SaaS company because a VC mentioned to me, dude, you should be a consultant now. Because if you think about it, if you, let's say, you know, this happens a lot, especially in Silicon Valley, they want to hire a banner marketer from a big company like Amazon or Netflix or Google mm -hmm. or something to show investors. We just poached a guy from Google, but that person had unbelievable amount of resources with a team underneath them. And they're not work, used to working really hard and rolling their sleeves up. And so they actually end up majority of the time being a bad hire. 
And so, if, but if you think about it, that person has maybe five companies of experience as opposed to me or an, a consultant of 10 plus years has hundreds of projects under their belt. So this VC that I'm thinking about always used to be like, Andrew's seen that movie before. And so he's able to know the future for you. And so I think consultants, um, consultants is what we call ourselves as opposed to an agency is definitely the right thing to do in a certain point of time. But it's, it depends on what resources you already have in the team, you know, and what channels you want to focus on. Like I just went through a whole bunch of marketing stuff that you may or might not, may not be doing. That was the tip of the iceberg. And we do all of that for a client for six to 12 months. And then at the end of that, one of our team members is a senior level tech recruiter, 10 plus years, ex Amazon, et cetera. We start creating job descriptions and hiring individual people to focus on those things with data behind that. For instance, you know, if that PR strategy that we growth hacked in the beginning for you worked really well, then we start recommending the team. I think you should hire a, a, a PR person. And then we do a cost benefit analysis of bringing that internally or hiring an agency that just does PR and cybersecurity space or something. So we kind of, um, our one-stop shop. And so if that is something that you have the finances for, I think you can move faster with, with an agency, but definitely don't just hire a marketing agency that does SEO. I don't like SEO agencies at all. That's a whole nother conversation. We growth hack SEO, get it all done, all the on-page stuff in one month. Whereas an agency strings you along for like one year, low, low cost per month. And then they do all the work in that first month and they just release some shitty blogs throughout the year. And I don't think that's good. So my point is, if it's a startup focused agency that has a track record like we have at Growth Experts, then I think that's great. But a marketing agency that's used to big clients that are you know okay with incremental small growth, then that's not going to work for a startup. Um, mm -hmm. Bringing it in house, like I said, can take several months, and so that tends to be really expensive. Um, at the same time, you know the pool, like I mentioned, of startups that we work with is really small because it has to be a perfect product market fit for us to where we know we're going to have a major win or we don't even want to touch it, especially like funding wise, because we don't want to be a major burn rate killer for that company. So it doesn't always work out. And so over the past few years, I've developed a coaching program and I don't know if there's others out there that really work the same way, but I think that you know, whether you, a comp person listening works with me or not, this is a really good opportunity. There's a ton of interns out there that want to get experience in startups, right? And the problem is if you just hire a marketer that has no experience, you need to spend a lot of time coaching, giving them advice, telling them what to do. And so this coaching program that we have at Growth Experts is I'm a fractional CMO for the company. Um, we have 50 online courses, workbooks. I wrote a book. Um, called the Startup Growth Book that teaches this student what to do. And then we have weekly coaching sessions as a company. So we're able to, for a very low cost, remove the founder from marketing to just one hour a week and then asynchronous chat, reviewing documents, making sure everything's up to par. So that personally has been much, much more rewarding. I mean, the consulting, no offense to you, tends to only help like white male SaaS founders that are getting tons of funding. Whereas the coaching is, you know, underrepresented founders around the world are able to pay for this while they're still bootstrapped. We make them investable. We get them in front of investors towards the end of that coaching program. But also we have, I mean, that cl client I mentioned in Egypt has been in my coaching program for a year and a half and their product is multi-million dollar product. They have millions of dollars in revenue. They just don't want to spend tons of money on marketing. They're, you know, they're an engineering focused team. So I think if you can find low cost opportunities out there uh, and if someone in your team has marketing experience, then an intern route might be the way to go. But, and you can just bring in a consultant to coach them or teach them every once in a while. So there is a third option there. Um, to keep costs low, but I definitely think mm -hmm. stay away from the super long answer. I'm sorry, but you, you struck no, a chord. Good. This is good. But, yeah, yeah, it's hot. <laughs> but, but, but uh, stay away from marketing agencies that are just one channel because you're going to have to manage okay. 10 agency relationships. And you know, one, you don't know what channel is really going to drive the highest ROI for you. You have an inkling, you've tested the water. Some things are working, some things are not working, but that's a lot of the, a lot of the reason is because you've been doing it. No offense. You, you know, like you're also working on fundraising. I mean, that takes so sure. much time over the last few years, even, um, and managing the team and working with Mark on product and all that other stuff. And so, um, consultants or a coach are probably the best way to go at your stage for sure.
Okay, excellent. And, and I suppose further to that, um, advice to a startup looking to engage a, an agency or a consultant, what, what's a good way to structure something that's kind of performance based? And I know this is hard and perhaps a bit of a loaded question given you're on the other side of the fence as well, but, uh, but while, while I've got you, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of want to know, it's like, hey, yeah. if I'm going to invest in this thing and I'm spending thousands of dollars a month or whatever it's going to be, how do you kind of work it? Like, do you just need yeah. to know you're backing the right horse or how do you kind of get some KPIs where we can say, okay, over this period, we've got to hit these sort of targets or at least just say, hey, we're getting X number of leads in or a certain ROI on ad spend or whatever. A really good that. marketing agency is not going to do that. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if they don't have the case studies to show you that they're worth their salt and what they're talking about, then end the conversation immediately. Mm -hmm. But um, up until this year, I never acknowledged any of those conversations ever. I was always like, you know, we're cash. We don't know you. You're an early stage startup. You know, you, you don't even you don't normally have a lot of the marketing traction that you even have. Like you have a hundred customers. If someone's pre-product and they're like, Andrew, can we do a cash equity split? You no, know, absolutely not. You know, we have the track record. You don't. And so, but we at Growth Experts actually took on some investment this year. We brought on a VC as a chief strategy officer, and we are rolling out a product where um, we're going to work with clients for three months, cash only. And then after three months, we're going to take equity and a very low, just keep the lights on cost. So mm -hmm. that is something that uh, we're interested in. And the reason that is because we had a client, many clients have gone on to, I mean, I have a client, an ex-client in Australia that's at the nine figure valuation different different mm -hmm. .com .au was an er, one of our earliest clients at growth experts that we launched. So we have a lot of clients that we didn't take equity from. Um, but we didn't, we weren't, I was just, you know, young and dumb and really interested in making a ton of money, uh, while I was traveling the world. But we had a client in 2019 that was begging us to take equity because this was a home run. It was in the marketing space. I, uh, did not do that. And he's doing about 60 mil ARR now. And so mm -hmm. um, that plus meeting Kelly, my chief strategy officer, we've decided now that we are going to be taking some of those equity bets. And so um, that is an opportunity for a seasoned vet like myself. But as far as when people reach out to me, or, or, you know, in a sales conversation, they're like, how can we make this performance related? I'm happy to include some kind of bonuses, but it's, you know, like we have a set fee, you know, at our level of success, you know, the ROI is proven because we have references. I mean, most agencies will never give you a reference, but we're happy to do that. We have a lot of NDAs with a lot of previous clients, but we have about five or six case studies where you can go and reach out to those founders. So that's the key thing to look for is look for a company. I mean, a lot of startups want to see experience in their industry and we're industry agnostic. So we don't have a lot. I mean, we don't have a client in the cybersecurity space that we can necessarily show or compliance space, but B2B SaaS focused clients, of course. And so as long as you see case studies, oh, wow, that's exactly the stage that we were at. That was the exact problem that we had. Similar funding. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. And then as long as that company can walk you through what they did with that previous customer, you should be able to rest at night knowing that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. The last thing is you don't mm -hmm you won't want to get locked into any kind of contractual obligations like growth experts is just month to month because again, why the same thing we're sticky like you, if we're working our ass off and you're seeing it happen and, and working, um, there's no reason to go anywhere. And we understand things happen with startups, but we're pretty picky about who we work with. So with the coaching program, we do ask for three months up front because it's um, really intensive to bring on an intern and times like that and stuff like that. But the, um, sure. uh, so short answer is, yeah most agencies are going to say, fuck off. And, you know, if you're asking for performance related stuff, um, but a, a, a senior level agency like growth experts, we're starting to say, okay, well, let's start with some cash because we want to prove out what your end of the bargain. We want to see that you're able to move quick with the data that we're getting. We want to see that your product team is actually uh, delivering the promises that we're making as a marketing team. Uh, how we all work together, you know, are there other red flags that I won't even mention, you know, related to team dynamics and, you know, time change and whatever it could be. But um, uh, we've worked with Australian time zone before, so it shouldn't be an issue. But anyway, my point is those three months, we learn all that. And get It's also, also like the ultimate due diligence as an investor. And then we're able to make an equity play from there with a company at your stage. So I think you can look for those kind of deals, but yeah, related sure. to performance, and, and you might performance, get a, I meant, a big yeah, firewall there with, with a lot of the people. Or whatever else, that were just, yeah, understanding the options there. So 
Um, but good to understand how you guys work. And I suppose final question on that front is, and, and probably a how long's a piece of string question, but <clears throat> for a B2B SaaS business like ours, kind of pre-seed funded, what's kind of the usual monthly marketing budget that you'd think to, to allocate? And again, I know that's like, you know, a thousand and one variables on that, but yeah, just to kind of pick your brain on that. I mean, we've got, we've got ours yeah. that's in our forecast, but yeah, just can't no, 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 it's not the range. No, it's yeah. not. You've already told me all the variables. The bottom line is with a $15,000 assumed or estimated LTV, you can do whatever you want and you uh, to, as a test. So, but I'm a scarcity focused marketer in the beginning. I want to make sure we've covered every organic channel possible. And then once we get the data coming in of what's working, then we can scale that up. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, there's some baseline stuff you want to do. Any competitor keywords, we want to own them on Google search. Like it doesn't matter what they cost. It will always, always work. You get about a 40% average click through rate on those and it pisses off every competitor. You get a ton of really good exposure to people who are, I'm the CTO at a company. CEO goes, Hey, somebody just reached out to me from from compliancechamp.io, whatever the hell it is, go and check out their tool. Then they go to Google and search compliance mm. champ and they see your ad and they end up clicking on your ad and they just go, Hey, I actually found something better that does has X, Y, Z features that are better. And it's here in Australia. We should use them. And then boom, you steal that client. So there's some baseline paid stuff that we should do. And I would think, you know, $2,500 a month is more than enough to do all of those paid things. Like between the LinkedIn ad to that small target demographic, you know, promoting those blog posts that I was talking to, talking about and um, the search stuff. And, you know, like I, like I said, I have previous clients in similar tiny spaces. It wasn't even that much money to really own the space and have people seeing you. And just knowing that even if it closes only one client a year, at the end of the day, it's break even because our LTV is so high. So you don't, those are the only things you really need to spend money on in the early stages. Cause it's just like, you know, and even the LinkedIn stuff we could hold off on because like I said, we can do the outreach. I, I, uh, you mentioned woodpecker, there's other tools, um, duck soup, mm -hmm. uh, conversify mm -hmm. other tools out there that do this automated LinkedIn outreach. So you don't even need to run the ads. But what I meant with the ads is those technical blog posts on what, like, you know, the problems that you're solving and the speaking to the CTO type blog posts, those tend to be very cheap, 500 bucks a month on LinkedIn ads. And nobody says this. I might be the only person in the entire world. No, but I, I, I have been out of the US for a long time. I say I'm based in San Francisco. I go there about half the year. I'm in Mexico right now. But, but anyway, long story short, um, so that's, that's the only paid stuff we really need to spend on in the beginning. And then all the money in the budget goes towards uh, working with, you know, either building out a marketing team, working mm -hmm. with a consultant. Mm -hmm. Um, and a consultant shouldn't just be coming in to tell you what to do. You need help actually executing it. That's why I was saying the coaching program might be a good fit. And it's really based on your decision. You know, like if you have high NPS and clients convert in one hour, then I would invest a lot in marketing and just go for, let's scale it up. We know the product's sticky. We know the ROI is going to be there. I would, if you were earlier and, oh, we're not really closing a lot, we got to figure out what's missing in the product. Then I would say, keep it low with a coaching program and but it sounds like things are really working and you can pour gas on this fire and so i would say spend on getting marketing help to to go fast but everything that you can you should focus on besides that little baseline spend should be doing the pr um doing the content doing the seo um, maybe some influencer stuff like for cybersecurity or entrepreneur, like a, building out an affiliate and a referral program for stuff like this can make a lot of money for somebody who's like a cybersecurity expert to start referring this or even a, an influencer in the SME space that starts talking about this and referring this to customers can really mm -hmm. make res residual income. So building out a program like that, those things don't cost any money. And so uh, it's just time and effort. And so baseline, a couple thousand dollars spend you know, five to $10,000 on an, an agency. And that's not going to really burn your, your burn rate too crazy, especially because you've got the other rays on the horizon. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are right at about an hour. One of my favorite interviews so far, Damien, thanks so much for the advice also on, on for startup founders. That was really cool. So anybody that is trying to sell to bigger companies, and wants to avoid having any major compliance issues and emergencies, you can go to Apollo Secure, Google it, find Damien Cantello, find him, <laughs> ask him questions. 
let them know that you found out about it from this podcast thanks, in the future. And uh, Damien, thanks so much for coming, man. Really appreciate you. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. See ya. That has been another episode of the Growth Experts Funded Now What Podcast with your host, Andrew Lee Miller. If you liked this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you really liked it, please share with other startup founders and entrepreneurs and business owners in your network. Thank you so much and we'll see you on the next episode.